evening. Welcome to our evening worship service. Welcome to those who are here in Warren Hall. Welcome to all of you joining us on Facebook. We're delighted that everybody can be here, either in uh, Warren Hall or with us virtually. It's great to have everybody here tonight, here to worship God and to celebrate the third Sunday of Advent. Uh, as we say hello to everybody, I just want to remind you of a few important announcements that you'll find uh, most of these there in your bulletin, but um, just a heads up also to make you aware of so many different things that are happening in the life of our church over the next few weeks. We are leading up through this season of Advent into the uh, celebration of Christmas. So please do uh, remember next Sunday we have our Christmas caroling adventure where we will load up in a couple of buses and go to a few retirement homes and some members' homes and we will Christmas carol and then come back here for a chili supper. Some people are doing one of those. Some people are doing both. Um, the good part about our chili supper is it will also include some of our evening worship yes. as well. And so that will be in the activity center next uh, Sunday evening, not in here, but in the AC, that we'll be having um, those who are part of the chili supper will also be worshiping with us. And thank you to our musicians, as always, for being adaptable and being flexible is always so helpful. So we're grateful for that. And we certainly uh, look forward to that next Sunday evening. And then just to let you know a little bit of the schedule after that, on December the 26th and on um, Sunday the 2nd of January, so not next week, but the two Sundays after that, we will be taking a holiday break from our evening worship service because we have folks who are traveling, some folks going home to visit relatives, and uh, it's just such a busy time anyway. So we'll not have our evening worship service on the 26th or on January the 2nd, but January the 9th. We'll be back in here and look forward to seeing everybody back in here for that. And next Sunday evening, if you can. Um, so many good things happening. Um, you'll see announcements about our Christmas Eve worship services that will take place. We have a family service at 3.30 on Christmas Eve, uh, led primarily by the children of the church. And that's such a great fun time. And then our 5.30 Christmas Eve service, we have lessons and carols and communion in the sanctuary. And then 11 o'clock, we'll have Christmas in the chapel next door in our beautiful Evans Chapel. 11 o'clock in the evening, and the lights are down low. And it's such a wonderful time of worship on Christmas Eve for that. Special word of welcome for, uh, special word of gratitude for those who helped with room in the inn last night. Room in the Inn is part of our ministry to homeless persons in the greater Memphis area. And so we welcomed several guests last night, and they stayed in our community room. And we had a good crew uh, work on that and help support that. And so we will be doing that again in January, uh, February, and March. And so be on the lookout for those sign up genius links that we can sign up and help support that great ministry within our church. Um, one or two things more before we uh, start, and that is to uh, remind you of something special we do every year here, and that's the Christmas Eve Offering Challenge, where we invite people to make an offering on Christmas Eve, and if we have guests here worshiping on Christmas Eve in any of those services, then 100% of what the offering is on Christmas Eve goes to, every year, two of our mission partners. And so we're supporting Binghampton Christian Academy this year supported before and the Rising Together Foundation. Both of those organizations work with young people in the Memphis area um, all year long. The Rising Foundation, the Rising Together Foundation is a summer program, kind of a continuation of learning and tutoring and mentoring and athletics in the summer. So if you're here on Christmas Eve, we'll take up the offering, but we want everybody to know that uh, we give 100% of our offerings to um, to those two partnering entities in the community. And the challenge word that's put on there is the Christmas Eve offering challenge, is that we challenge everybody to give as much or as close as they can, however much we spend on presents, to give that same amount in an offering, um, or as close as we can. And so um, we just love to be generous at Christmas time. Last announcement before we start is to celebrate um, things that happened earlier in our church service, and so we welcomed several new members into GPC today, and so I'm going to read their names to you um, as soon as I put on these helpers here. Anissa Brown joined this morning, and several people have gotten to know her as an 8.30 worshiper. Um, Andrea and Lance McKinnon joined, and they have a son who's a sixth grader named Ellis. 
Um, Corinne Mestemacher joined, and uh, you may know Mark and Christy Mestemacher, her parents, and so Corinne, uh, their daughter, joined. And then we have um, Courtney and Jay Page joined, along with their daughter, Sarah, who I think is a ninth grader, um, I believe. And then uh, Ruby Reed joined, and I think Ruby was a member a long time ago. Um, that's what she has uh, indicated to us, a member a long time ago, and then moved away and has moved back. So we want to welcome Ruby Reed back into uh, the life of Germantown Presbyterian Church. Um, and so I'll open us with prayer, with prayer, and then we'll have the lighting of the third Advent candle. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this night that we can come together out of the cold and be together in the warmth of your love and the warmth of worship. And so we pray that you would please be with us, descend upon us, Holy Spirit, as we come together to worship you. Lord, we are anticipating in this season of Advent the coming of your kingdom. And so let tonight be a foretaste of that coming kingdom where we worship you with all heaven and earth. We worship you tonight as we will in your kingdom in all eternity. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you to the fairy cross for lighting our third Advent candle. <laughs> Starting into our first song, uh, Dean Ontario Lee, who you normally would see on the keys. Well, we have his teacher. We have the one who taught Dean Ontario Lee. This is Dr. Ashley Davis. And so we want to welcome him. <laughs> and also, on the Kahoon, you would know we have Jeff Williams tonight. We have Dixon O'Leary. And uh, he's got the, the cajon and some shakers. So uh, we'll have a wonderful time with him as well. So if you would like to join us by standing. Okay. okay. Um, this first song we were singing um, is called Rejoice in the Lord. And, you know, Psalms 150 and 6 says, When everything has birth, praise the Lord. So as we sing this song, it's very upbeat. So feel free to call out for it. Just have fun with it.
musical, high, uh, musical theater in high school, and something my teacher would tell me is the reason your character is randomly busting in a song <laughs> is because they have so much emotion that merely speaking it will not do. We don't do that very often today. <laughs> That's kind of weird. We like to be a little bit more reserved than that. But the song we're about to sing is Goodness of God. If there was anything that is worth busting out in song and singing, it is the goodness, the faithfulness of our God. So let's sing that. Of 
her lap. And she just held me so close. And she gently rocked me and through her own tears, she told me that the Faye hadn't had the flu as she and I had been told. But instead she had had an illness that she could not recover from, something called leukemia, and that she had died. And I just think now how difficult that conversation must have been for my mom. She kept the secret of LaFay's illness because her parents didn't want her to know, and so if she couldn't know, then I couldn't know. But in that moment, just her calming and reassurance, her peaceful presence with me, stayed with me not only then, but in the hard days that followed, and then to this point, which has been a long time. I imagine that we all have voices, like I had my mom's to remember, because when we love someone so deeply, their voices stay with us. Even after they're no longer with us here physically, we really do hear those whispering voices of comfort and calm. They steady us. They give us an anchor. They ground us when we most need to hear a sense of peace and to feel that peace. Oftentimes when we think of peace, we think of peace treaties or an agreement at the end of some kind of difficult situation. I was thinking about peace treaties as I was preparing for this sermon, and so I did a search on Wikipedia, and I was really surprised to see hundreds and hundreds of peace treaties listed. And then I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't be quite so surprised because human beings that we are, we've been in conflict with each other since the beginning of time. And conflicts seem to come when we've got some sort of inner conflict and then we project it on to whomever's in front of us or who, whatever other group of people or we begin to clash. And oftentimes it's because we're putting that forth. We ourselves don't have a sense of peace. And I think that this inner peace is what we're missing, is what we long for. The peace that we really, really need, especially in this season of Advent, as we await the Prince of Peace. You know, Paul writes in his letter to the church at Philippi of such a peace. He begins his letter with a sense of gratitude for that community sharing the gospel message from the beginning of their time together until the time of Paul's writing. He affirms their deep love for God and Jesus Christ and their love and care for one another. And then he extols them to continue in his absence to remain united in Christ even if a disturbance or a disagreement or some sort of murmuring argument might begin to bubble forth. And then he gets to the heart of the matter of his letter. For even though Paul is writing while incarcerated somewhere in Greco-Roman world, probably Rome, but maybe Caesarea or Ephesus, Paul's gotten word that there are two women in that church, Eodia and Sintachia, most likely heads of house churches, and therefore overseers and helpers in the spread of the gospel, but they're having a disagreement. The word has gotten to Paul, and we don't know, but maybe it's over the direction of the church. Paul then urges the whole community of faith to help these women find peace, to come to a compromise for the sake of the gospel. Paul's right. For how can a gospel, the gospel of love and peace, be shared when there's bickering? Paul longs for peace and unity among the Christian community there, and his message reverberates far beyond that writing 
being in that community, for we too long for peace. Peace on earth, peace among all people, peace between nations, peace in our own nation, in our state, our community. We even long for there to be peace among Christians, peace in our families. We long for peace, just like Paul does. We know of more factions than we know of unity. And we long for these divisions among us to come to an end. When we think about it, we first heard in Scripture about a fracture in the Genesis narrative. For just as God was creating humankind, made in God's holy image, very quickly in the narrative story in Genesis, the first humans disobeyed God's instructions to them. And then they blamed others. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the snake. Neither one takes responsibility for their own actions. They had to have a sense of shame and guilt and conflict within themselves, and they inflicted it on others. Can there ever be peace when we fail to take responsibility for our own actions? Nearly all divisions, discord, fractures, factions, throughout human time are not of God's doing. It's of human doing, each and every time. So how then might there be peace? Where might it begin? Paul writes that there are actual steps to finding peace. And that it begins by rejoicing in the Lord our God. And then he continues with an expansion of this meaning. He moves, he gives us steps that move from what to how and then why. In this short passage that we just read, Paul has given us these steps. What is to put aside all divisions for the sake of the gospel? How? By rejoicing in the Lord our God doing. We just sang about rejoicing in the Lord our God. We come together in this space to praise God. And on this, the third Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of joy. Joy in Jesus' birth and life where he showed us how we're supposed to live. Joy in his saving death on the cross and his resurrection that overcame death for us all. Certainly, we have so much to rejoice about. So what does rejoicing look like? Besides singing beautiful music and fellowshipping with one another, Paul insists that it looks like gentleness. Gentleness, then, looks like calm. Looks like having a very gentle or peaceful spirit. Whether we are in a pleasant or a situation that might have adversity to it, we're called to have this gentle spirit. What it's not is roughness or gruffness or bitterness or discord or cynicism or sarcasm. None of that is gentleness. Paul also says that gentleness looks like trusting God without worrying about anything. The prophet Isaiah says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my might. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on the Lord's name. Sing praises to the Lord. Shout aloud and sing for joy. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Trusting in God to provide for our every need every day is one of the hardest things that we humans try to do, even us Christians. We say we trust in God until something's not quite going like we want it to go, and then we take that trust right back and we try to fix it. It won't be surprising to hear that that's not trusting God. That's like giving lip service to God, and it's not how we as followers of Jesus Christ are called to live our lives. It's not joyful. It's 
It's not peaceful. It's not having a gentle spirit. So what is it we're supposed to do when things are not going right, when our life is upside down, when we need to make big decisions? These are the times that we become the most anxious. Can you imagine if Adam and Eve had been, had, can't you imagine just how anxious they must have been when they discovered that God had found them out? How did they respond? Not peacefully. No, they started blaming. Eve received Adam's blame. The snake received Eve's blame. It's a good lesson for us to reflect back on and learn how not to live. Right? <laughs> but instead, to follow the words that I just shared from the prophet Isaiah and the words that we just heard from the apostle Paul, their words are words of advice that will never leave us until that time comes when there is peace on earth and goodwill among all people. But how can we come to trust in God day in and day out? Paul has an answer for us. In everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. Supplication simply means appeal or plea. It's the same as request and prayer. So when we are perplexed about the next right thing that we're supposed to do, or we're making a decision with our families, or any kind of decision, we're supposed to take those concerns in prayer to God. And if we need more reminder, prayer is mentioned almost 400 times. From Genesis to Revelation, and 29 times we have in Scripture that Jesus turns to God in prayer. So surely that's what we're supposed to do. Why then do we oftentimes forget? We fail to turn to God in prayer. We forget to ask for God's guidance and direction. The reason that we do, I think, is because somehow we allow anxiety overtake us. We just forget that as the adopted children of God, as followers of Jesus Christ, we've been shown over and over again in Scripture that we have a different pathway that we can take, and it's the pathway of prayer. So that's the what and the how and the why. Why? Why should we turn to God in prayer? We might even say, what's in it for me? As harsh as that sounds, Paul's ready, and he has the answer. He says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine such a peace washing over you? A peace you don't even know that you're in need of right now. I invite you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Just breathe deeply. Ask God for what you need right now. Just breathe. Turn to God. Jesus is sitting right beside you and is holding your hand, offering you calm and reassurance that everything is going to be okay. It's like my mom holding me in her lap and gently rocking me and assuring me that even though we won't experience death together, that Christ has overcome death and that one day I'll be able to see my friends again. This be your peace today. May it be your peace every day as you take all of your concerns and your worries to God in prayer. Trust in God for 
God is good and will uphold you by God's victorious hand. We hopeful, we long for peace. Here, there, and everywhere. May it begin right here in this place. And may we then share the peace that washes over us and keeps our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, renewing us with strength and courage every day that comes to us every time we take our concerns to the Lord in prayer. May we share this peace with everyone that we meet, with our families, with our children, with our siblings, with our spouses, with our neighbors, with the men and women that we meet on the street corner right here in our city, so that Christ's peace will ripple out into all the world, and one day the whole world will know peace. Friends, you've already shared the peace of Christ with one another. But right now, right now, I invite you to turn to those on your right and your left and say to them, may the peace of Christ be with you. 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 Indeed, may there be peace on earth and may it begin with each and every one of us as we take our concerns to God in prayer day in and day out. May it be so, and to God be all glory, honor, and praise. A moment of reflection. Oh, let's have a moment of reflection. I'm sorry. So, okay, just let's just be quiet again. Let's just absorb what you've heard. Let's just be quiet and still. are going to minister to you. Um, it is a very well-known song, though, so I do invite you to join in if you know it. Um, one of the verses in this song says, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide. Um, so I just ask that we sing this, that even with what Pastor Susie said, um, that we would be reminded God is a good father and he is perfect in all of his ways and by knowing that we can have peace knowing that we can trust in him. So I invite you to sing a good thought with us.
Friends, each evening we do have the opportunity to give an offering, and so there's an offering plate that is in the back of the room, and it's there, and if you are able tonight to make an offering to support the work of the church, then that's certainly available to us. And we will dedicate not only that offering, but dedicate ourselves in service and love of Christ uh, through this prayer now. So please join me in prayer. Gracious and Almighty God, you are the creator of everything. You are the creator of each one of us, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And for that gift of life, O oh God, we give you our heartfelt thanks. We know that you reach out to each one of us and reach out to all creation in very powerful ways each and every day. And so, O oh God, we are grateful for not only making us, but creating this world in which we live. Lord, you have created, above all other things, the gift of hope. And we know that this season of Advent is about expectant hope. Hoping the best for us, hoping the best for those that we love. Hoping for your coming kingdom. And so, Lord, we do pray for your kingdom to come. We pray, O oh God, for your reign to be sufficient in all of creation. On this night, O oh God, we know that there are particular people not very far away from us who are in special need of hope because their worlds have been turned upside down by the storms of this weekend. Lord, we think of those people in Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, others in the Ohio Valley who have been so uh, devastated by the destruction of the tornadoes. And so, Lord, we even as we picture the images that we've seen from places like Mayfield, Kentucky, in our minds, Lord, we pray for those people there. We pray earnestly for them and for their recovery. We pray, O oh God, that you would protect all the rescue workers and protect all the citizens of those towns. We pray, O oh God, that you would help them slowly but surely to rebuild and to renew. And even before then, O oh God, right now in the midst of their grief and their shock, we do pray for that peace that passes all understanding. The peace that Susie just preached about, Lord, that peace that is beyond all words. And Lord, even if the people of those towns can't even pray to you right now and, and don't know how to make supplication because they are so shell-shocked, Lord, let us pray for them. Let us lift up their needs before you. And if they don't have the words to articulate what they need more than anything else, Lord, we will do it for them. And we will pray for your presence and your provision and for your grace upon grace to be sufficient in their weakness right now. And Lord, we also pray for those who are close to us in our families and in our church families, those who need your healing touch in their lives because they are sick or they are hurting. They may, oh God, be in some vulnerable place right now in a relationship. And so we pray for them. We pray for those who are in our hospitals. We pray for those who are recovering at home from extensive surgeries and from treatments and from other maladies, Lord, of body and mind. Be so close to them, oh God. Be so close to them and minister to them and may they know that their church family loves them, and that they are held so closely in the palm of your hand. And Lord, we do dedicate ourselves to your service as we join our many voices into one, and as we pray the prayer that Christ Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art, who art in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand and join us for our final song, which is a song of declaration. Great are you, Lord.